Good morning, everyone. And thank you for braving uh, the fire drill to be here uh, this morning. Uh, I am Camille Sakamara, and I'm the Senior Program Officer for West and Central Africa here at NED. Uh, I am surrounded by professionals and Gambian experts who will lead us through a discussion on some of the challenges and opportunities that uh, Gambia has been facing. I would like to welcome all of you to uh, the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, as you may know, today marks the 22nd anniversary of Yaya Jame's military coup, which brought him to power. However, the idea of this public event is um, to constructively discuss the current political and human rights context in the Gambia, to engage U.S. officials as, um, on what they see as a priority in the country, but also to find solutions to the most pressing issues that the country has been facing over the past uh, few years. All of this is especially important because Gambia will have presidential elections um, at the end of this year in December. And the million dollar question is, will Yaya Jame be re-elected? My colleague Elizabeth Marcotte uh, came up with this great idea of, public, of putting a public event together on a country that does not receive uh, much attention from the international community. Um, when I, I talk about the Gambia with my colleagues, I, I often describe it as the Florida of West Africa or as the country that has the most uh, beautiful airport um, in West Africa. However, uh, things do not seem uh, so rosy on the inside. As you might know, um, Gambia is the last remaining dictatorship uh, in West Africa. The NET has been paying attention uh, to the Gambia since 2012, which is the year in which we started our, our program in the country. We're also part of the DC-based Gambia Working Group uh, alongside uh, Human Rights Watch and uh, other uh, organizations. All right, so you have the full bios available for all of our speakers, uh, but let me briefly introduce them to you. Let me start on my left here. Stephen Felstein, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Democracy human rights and labor. He's responsible for DRL's work in Africa, international labor affairs, and international religious freedom. Previously, Mr. Feldstein served as the director of the Office of Policy in the Bureau for Policy, Planning, and Learning at USAID. Thank you for being here. Aisatu, hello. Dr. Aisa Tuture is the executive director and founding member of the Gambia Committee on Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women and Children. Her organization is mostly known under the name Gamco Trap. Um, Dr. Toure, uh, through Gamco Trap, has been leading a campaign to improve women's political participation in the Gambia through public debates on sensitive social cultural issues. Thank you for making it uh, all the way from Banjul. Uh, Jim, hello. Uh, Jim Warmington is a researcher in the Africa Division of Human Rights Watch, uh, where he covers West Africa. He was previously an attorney at the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative, where he conducted research to inform rule of law and human rights development programs. Thank you for being here. Pasamba. Hi. Basamba Jao is a founding member and spokesman of, the, of one of the most well-known diaspora Gambian activist groups, the Democratic Union of Gambian Activists, DUGA. He's a longtime community, civil, and human rights activist and political commentator. All of these people here have, have Twitter accounts, so please follow them. Okay, so before uh, we start, I will have to um, uh, give you a couple of logistical uh, points. We have not asked panelists to come with prepared remarks. Instead, uh, I will be leading them through um, the discussion. Uh, Dasville's team will be leaving a little early to go to a very important meeting, so we're very grateful that he's, he, he's been able to make it uh, uh, this morning. So when you're ready, just leave, and uh, we'll, we're very happy that you're here. Uh, you can follow the conversation um, uh, for this event on Twitter. Hashtag NED events, and you can participate in the discussion and tweet about it um, at any democracy, net democracy. 
so please, if you have questions and you're following us um, online, please do not hesitate to tweet your questions or comments. Uh, the event will be live streamed and you'll be able to watch it on Ned's website whenever it is ready. Okay, thank you again for being here and uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Touré. Hello. Your organization has been involved in uh, promoting women's rights in the Gambia. Today, what do you think are the most pressing issues for um, women's political participation uh, in the Gambia? Thank you very much, and I think this is a very, very important question, looking at the current politics, political situation in the Gambia and governance situation. Uh, women have um, traditionally not been given the right space in participating effectively in the political process, except as singers, dancers, cooks, and so on. So this is the status quo we wanted to reverse. And through that process, we were engaging women to look at what are the issues that are important in engaging effectively. Uh, to make sure that they are there where the decision, um, decisions are made, where policies are made in order to advance democracy and promote human rights and fundamental freedoms. So uh, the problems that we have been facing, looking at it, uh, we did not just bring it out of our heads because it was based on research, based on the intervention and the support of the NET project that we were able to engage various political parties coming from different parties to discuss with them what are the challenges, what is the progress, and what is the way forward. And based on some of those discussions we had, all the parties, there were commonalities, there were differences and specificities. So what we have found out was that the shrinking democratic space for women, there is zero tolerance or almost intolerance for women's effective participation in politics. And most of the party women, women who were within these parties actually expressed that that they are part of the parties, they are very loyal to the parties, but they are, they are, the space was not democratic for them to be engaged. There was also no freedom of expression because most of the expressions were derived from male-dominated organs and they had to follow. That was another uh, area. There were also human rights abuses in the sense that what they realized was that when they come out to say, okay, now we are matured enough or we are aware that we have the capacity, ability to engage, you have abuses from within the parties and inter-parties, and there were threats and all sorts of things that were taken to them. These were commonalities that came out. And then, of course, there was impunity and abuse of power in the sense that when women come out, even within the ruling party, to uh, participate within the party, they were being ostracized. It was made difficult for them. And sometimes they cannot face those challenges and had to withdraw in their shells and keep quiet, meaning that they are there to follow, they are there to participate, and to vote for people, uh, mainly men, who could uh, to take those positions. Then uh, we also had the whole problem of uh, the persecution of some of those defenders, you know, who are really out to defend their parties to say women have to come out. They have rights to be in the presidency. They have rights to be in the National Assembly. They have rights to be in the local councils. But then the situation is not facilitating it for the fact that there are weaknesses of the institutions. And they do not actually take care of the fact that these women are not only there to vote, but they are also there to give and be part of the governance process and to contribute effectively. Well, some of the uh, thing, and lack of respect also for the Constitution, because if you look at it, the Constitution provides equal opportunities for both men and women to uh, participate effectively in politics. So those provisions are not taken account of. And there is also another stumbling block. A lot of the women who are part of those parties and who also want to be part of the process are not educated and may find it very difficult to put their agency. So that is why Gamco Trap, as a women's rights organization, decided to bring those parties together, try to interrogate gender, looking at gender analysis, using a gender analytical framework to be able to uh, examine the dynamics of the gender gap in order for us to bring it as a public debate. This has been very useful for the fact that all the parties, when they came at the beginning, were all defending their own. All the women were saying, I'm coming from this party, I am coming from that party. And as a result, it was difficult. But later on, when we came in and interacted, there were commonalities. The common issues were they are all committed to their parties, but they were not getting the freedom and the opportunities that was necessary for them to reach a particular level uh, in that. And it was even worse for the opposition parties 
because you will find that even whereas it was uh, the opposition party uh, who had given the women the chance, but then the shrinking democratic space for those women to come, because we have had women give testimonies of how they were trying to come out. Their parties gave them the opportunity to come out and buy, but they were being harassed by the security forces. They were being uh, uh, blamed, and even they were passing through their families to stop them from being part of it. So all these are gender issues that have created the, the process uh, making it difficult. And the fact that there is a non-independent judicial system looking at the issue, where are you going to do that complaint? So the answer for us was to engage into constructive dialogue, to engage into awareness creation and consciousness raising in which all these parties will be reached irrespective of who is in the ruling party or not to be able to have this constructive dialogue that women matter and women are important, and women can make a difference in the history and life of the Gambia and in the governance procedures, and that has been going. This has resulted in, for example, when we did the advocacy around 2008, there were 20 females who went into, elective, uh, uh, went into the elections for the national councils, and 15 were elected. They went through the elective position, and they succeeded. Now we are trying to engage Consentize, raise awareness to the public, not only within the parties, but reaching out to various target groups under the NET project to be able to address these gender inequalities, the discriminatory practices, and the gaps that do exist by raising their awareness that women do matter, women can do it, and the answer is that we are not telling them to go to any party, we are telling them that in your parties you have rights to become presidents, you have rights to become National Assembly members, or to vie for any elective position, and it should be based on the principles of equality and non-discrimination. And that is being heard, that is being responded to. So you will find that now the current momentum, as we reach to the 2016 elections, because we have three very critical years that we are going to work, 2016, 2017, 2018, 16, is very critical. This is the presidential election. Women have rights, and they should be given all the opportunities that they need to vie for the position in a democratic space where there is rule of law and fundamental freedoms and the respect for democracy, we are encouraging women to come out to vie equally like men. It is not against men. I want to make that very clear. It is about recognizing the agency, the potential, and the contributions that women can bring in the democracy, in the transition, to be able to move the Gambia forward. We are all citizens. They are intelligent. They have the expertise, the experience. So we try as much as possible to be tolerant, to recognize that both men and women have rights. But if women come out, they must be not be discriminated on the basis of their sex. They should not be. And this is what we have been doing. There is a fervent call now for a female to lead all over the world, particularly in Africa, where we have seen the shrinking democratic space, where it is highly male dominated uh, uh, leaderships, uh, we have seen a lot of flaws, and those flaws maybe women can learn from in order to bring in a new vibe of democracy to be able to move the country. When a woman leads, it will make a difference. And this is what Gamco Trap has been doing, and we are working across parties. We are not discriminating. And we are telling people that every person has a right to belong where you are, but we are saying that women's agency must be respected and must be recognized. And let's see what women can bring. And this is a good test for Gambia now that we are coming to the 2016 election. We should start with the presidency. If women can come out and they have the ability, they have something to offer, why not? This is what we are saying. Thank you very much, Aisatu. So you've painted uh, quite a grim picture of uh, some of the challenges that women are, are facing in the Gambia. However, your, the, the, the conclusion of uh, your presentation is that when women lead, it makes a difference. So I think this is uh, very positive. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, Pasamba uh, um, a question about um, uh, being part of the Gambian diaspora. The Gambian diaspora, especially in the United States, has been quite uh, active. Uh, I follow all of you on Twitter, uh, I, see, I see you on Facebook, uh, uh, it's wonderful. But we know that you've been quite concerned about the uh, 2016 electoral process. 
What do you think are the conditions for free and fair elections um, in The Gambia in 2016? Well, I want to first start by thanking so, thanking so very much and to thank Ned for uh, according us this opportunity to come here and discuss the plight of our country on its darkest day, which is today, July 22nd. Uh, the prospects for elections in the Gambia are very gloomy, and they are based on facts. It is irrefutable fact that for the past 22 years, a country that was once known as the champion of human rights in Africa was transformed into a country of victims. Most of us in the diaspora are victims of a regime because we have a democratic right that we have exercised. It is also a fact that just yesterday, Mr. Usedo Dabo, the leader of the leading opposition party in the Gambia, was sentenced to jail day before yesterday, and yesterday another group of protesters, and their only crime was exercising a constitutionally guaranteed right because Section 25 1D of the Constitution gives every Gambian the right to assemble peacefully and protest. But because they have a view that is contrary to that of the dictatorship that we have in our country, today they are sent to jail for three years. To us Gambians, this is nothing new. It has become the normalcy of that country. In that, uh, we see the Gambia, I see it as a prison in that you either become a prisoner of yourself because you have to imprison your political views and concerns, otherwise you'll become a prison of the regime where they take you and send you to mile two. So meaning you are never a free person in that country. And when we talk about elections, there are three co contradictions that we have to deal with. First of all, the opposition in 2012 had boycotted the elections, the parliamentary elections based on the electoral malpractices that are very evident in that country. So meaning that contradiction must be overcome first. Then you also have to deal with the torture to death of a leading executive member of an opposition party in Solo Sending, who was killed on the 15th or 14th, between 14 and 15th of April 2016 for exercising again a democratic right asking for electoral reforms. That contradiction must also be overcome. And then the bigger contradiction is, how do you go to elections when the executive of the main opposition party, the entire executive, had been sent to jail for three years? So this, I believe, must be overcome first before we even talk about going into elections. So I believe it is in the interest of the Gambian people, and this is where the international community must play a role, to ensure that if we are going to elections, we cannot just go to elections for the sake of voting. Elections is just a part of democracy. It does not guarantee democracy. Mm -hmm. We see elections in North Korea. We have seen it in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. We have seen it on the, in so many countries led by tyrants. Elections do not guarantee democracy. And you cannot have a genuine democratic process without people, people having the free will to determine their manner of government. Because that is lacking in the Gambia. To me, I see elections as nothing but a farce and something that will do nothing other than to legitimate an already a very illegitimate and tyrannical government. Thank you very much, Basamba. You uh, have mentioned the, the need for uh, the support of the international community um, in having free and fair elections in the Gambia. Could you also um, delve a little bit into uh, the support that regional organizations, um, such as civil society organizations in Dakar or in other uh, Western African countries could, could uh, provide to the Gambia to help uh, the 2016 elections? Thank you. Uh, I think I missed, the, missed the, the diaspora part of, of that. The diasporas, I will just deal with that quickly and then answer your question. The diaspora has been very, very active because we have the privilege of living in countries that are democratic. I can sit in the United States and criticize Yaya Jame. But any Gambian who does that in that country would end up like a solo sending, 
a chief Mane who's been missing now for 10 years, or anybody who has a view that is contrary to that of the tyrannical regime that we have in that country. So because we are very concerned about our situation, this is why the Gambia diaspora has become very active in advocating for a Gambia that will be democratic. Because we, uh, we also happen to be a very educated uh, uh, group. You know, because uh, in reality, if you meet one in every three Gambians have had some kind of college education. Mm -hmm. And we have the capacity in here. We have neurologists, Gambian neurologists. We have Gambian professors. We have all these people who are outside who want to contribute immensely towards the development of our country. Because the brain drain that we have had in our country as a result of dictatorship is immense. So those people that are outside who cannot contribute immensely in the country for the development of our country decide that since we are living abroad, let's use this opportunity to be able to be an advocate, a voice for the voiceless. Now, in in, as regards to the international the civil society groups, especially those in Dakar, some of them have done a tremendously good job. We cannot thank them enough. Whether it's Article 19, whether it's Amnesty International, whether it's RADO in Senegal, you name it. They've been in the forefront in fighting for democracy in our country. But the situation where we have a problem is they do not have counterparts in the, in, the, in the Gambia. Because even if you are a civil society group in the Gambia, you have to be restrained. Otherwise, you'll be crushed. Because now, NGOs are subject to control mm -hmm. at the office of the president. Mm -hmm. If Jamie doesn't like you, you are not operating. So meaning that every you, you are working on eggshells. You watch what you say, otherwise you may end up being in jail like Dr. Ture was. She was paraded to, 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 to kangaroo courts, charged with frivolous charges, put in jail, and all those conditions. So meaning that in the abs because of the absence of strong civil society groups, we rely so much on the diaspora and other civil society groups outside. So they have a tremendous role that they can play, these regional bodies, uh, uh, civil society groups, and even regional bodies, like what ECOWAS did in the 2011 elections, because they went there and decided, listen, these elections would never be free and fair, so there is no need to be here to monitor them. They left, and I hope the opposition had listened to them then, because of the opposition then had to deal with what ECOWAS saw. And I'm hoping that this time around, well, there was no opposition leader in jail then. You cannot send people in jail now and then expect people to come and monitor those elections. So that, that rule is very uh, important, and I hope the, the, the regional civil society groups and even other civil society groups around the world, like NET, like Human Rights Watch, like Human Rights Campaign, like all the civil society groups will continue the advocacy that they are doing, because believe me, it is doing a lot of good for our cause, and this is why today we are privileged to be sitting here talking about a country that is just twice the size of Delaware. Thank you very much, uh, Pasamba. Um, uh, from your presentation or from your remarks, I, I noted that um, you mentioned several times that elections do not guarantee democracy. I couldn't agree uh, more with this. However, um, elections, especially the elections in the Gambia, offer a momentum uh, that either will be seized or not. Um, I would like to turn to Steve. <coughs> Uh, what do you see um, as the U.S. government's role in the Gambia in guaranteeing free and fair elections for 2016? Because uh, it seems that uh, people on this table are quite uh, pessimistic. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question, and uh, thank uh, Ned as well for hosting a really important discussion uh, on a country that doesn't always get as much attention uh, as I think it deserves, especially in light of many of the concerns that we have uh, on the human rights situation and the political situation. A situation that I would point out didn't, uh, wasn't created uh, recently, but one that has been an ongoing uh, issue for several decades. Uh, so this is something that we uh, have grappled with for, for a while, and it's uh, really a, a pleasure to be uh, on a panel uh, uh, with my uh, distinguished panelists. Um, in, 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 in response to your question when it comes to elections, you know, I, I have to strongly agree in favor of what I've heard so far, and that you, know, you can't look at elections in isolation uh, and, and say, well, you know, what do we have to do in order to actually have an election day where people can vote uh, and, and they have a slate of candidates uh, that they are able to choose from? 
uh, because I think elections are much more than that, and the pre-electoral environment in particular uh, is something that is critically important to allowing the freedom of choice for candidates to and uh, to uh, uh, participate in campaign, uh, for people to be able to attend those rallies, for media to be able to cover those in a, uh, uh, the election in a free and fair manner. Uh, it's not just about lining up at polls on election day uh, if you don't have the first piece in place. And I think that is where, for us, the concern uh, is so critical right now. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, both an expression of protest uh, uh, in April and May, uh, and we have seen the uh, the response from the government as a result. And, and you know, I want to be very, uh, very clear about the U.S. government perspective uh, when it comes to the response. Uh, you know, we condemn uh, the response to peaceful protests that took place. Uh, freedoms of expression and assembly are fundamental rights that need to be and should be upheld in every functioning democracy. Uh, not only are we concerned about the uh, detention uh, and charging of those individuals, but we are also particularly concerned about reports of excessive use of force uh, uh, by Gambian security forces for those who are in detention, including the torture of protests in opposition figures. And of course, we are all aware uh, of the death of opposition leader Solo Sundang. That, though, that type of behavior and those type of uh, uh, results are things that uh, for us uh, are extremely concerning, not to mention, of course, U.S. citizen Fanta Darbo Jarawa, who is also one of many individuals not only detained but charged uh, two days ago uh, to a three-year sentence. So we're doing everything we can uh, uh, to ensure that all individuals arrested under the government's recent crackdown, uh, including Fanta, receive treatment in detention as consistent uh, with local law and international commitments. Uh, and we strongly believe that it's essential that the government uphold its international human rights obligations mm -hmm. uh, and, that the, and hold those individuals responsible uh, for the violations uh, uh, that have been alleged. Uh, we think that is a first and necessary step to eventually get to a point where you have a free electoral environment uh, that, that is conducive to, to holding elections. But right now, uh, that doesn't represent the situation that we're in. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, are you working with ECOWAS countries at all um, in trying to improve the situation in the Gambia? We're talking to a variety of partners. Uh, you know, I, I uh, am very well aware uh, of a, a recent ECOWAS uh, uh, AU UN uh, a visit to the Gambia, where there were fairly strong statements made about uh, the crackdown and the uh, uh, response of the government uh, to protests. And so, you know, one thing that I think has been useful. Uh, is that there have been many international partners uh, across the spectrum, certainly not uh, not just the U.S., not just ECOWAS, but many others uh, who have articulated in the last few months their concern about the situation in the Gambia. Uh, I would point to, uh, for example, the U.N. Human Rights Council statement in early June uh, that talked about two things, both talking about the crackdown on uh, uh, the opposition uh, protesters, uh, uh, but also talking about very concerning statements made by President Jame uh, related to a particular ethnic group, the Mandinka, uh, where there were uh, credible threats uh, made by him uh, uh, towards uh, that very that large uh, large group, uh, and this is the kind of thing that then elicited a response from uh, the, the uh, you, uh, from Adama Dien, uh, special advisor uh, on issues related to genocide, who who specifically said it is this type of rhetoric uh, that uh, potentially leads us down a very concerning path. Uh, so what what I think is useful is that there. Are are a lot of voices across the spectrum uh, from different organizations and from different countries uh, and different institutions uh, that are speaking up uh, about uh, the human rights situation. Okay. Thank you very much. And this will uh, be a perfect segue to Jim's work. I know that you've done a lot of research on the human rights situation uh, in the Gambia. Could you tell us about how you perceive um, the human rights context? Sure. I mean, I think others have maybe spoken about how grave the human rights context is. I think one thing I wanted to emphasize um, was really how I sometimes see a bit of a disconnect between the conversation that human rights groups are having about Gambia, and I think to some extent the diaspora, without wanting to speak for the diaspora, um, and those people who hold power um, inside the U.S. government, um, inside the EU, um, and other institutions that really have to make hard decisions about how they engage with the Gambia and with the Gambian government. And I think it's really incumbent on human rights groups and on perhaps the diaspora, again, without wanting to speak for them, um, for us to really think carefully about um, what that disconnect is and what it means. 
Um, I think that disconnect stems from maybe three things. Um, I mean, the first of which is that this is a very unpredictable regime uh, and one that is very centralized. So um, while there may be ministers who interact frequently with the US government or with others, ultimately decisions are made inside of state house uh, and often by President Jammeh himself. Um, it's also, to be totally frank, we, we talk a lot about change. Um, uh, it's a regime that's very entrenched. Uh, it's, this is 22 years. Um, the security forces inside the Gambia are extremely strong. Uh, they, are, they don't hesitate to crack down uh, where they need to. And therefore, I think that to say that the regime is anything other than entrenched is at this point a, a little hopeful. Um, and then finally, it's a regime in which, or a country in which many, many Gambians continue to live uh, on less than $2 a day, the vast majority, and poverty is, of course, a, a huge, huge challenge. Uh, and so we as human rights groups who are very focused, of course, on the, the awful political abuses uh, that we've seen in recent times and in recent history, I think we have to take into account those three assumptions and make arguments that take into account the fact that this is, uh, at this point, a critical election year um, but it's also a, a battle that many people have been fighting uh, for a long, long time. And I just want to illustrate, therefore, some of the conversations that I have as I advocate on these issues. Uh, and that is for people to say, well, look, you know, this is a, a regime and a government um, that we are dealing with, um, that we may have to deal with in the future. And therefore, when you ask us uh, to take uh, strong measures against them, uh, you have to take into account the fact that that may not allow us uh, to, to continue with development aid that may not allow us to, to address some of the issues uh, that the majority of Gambians living on $2 a day uh, have to face. And so I think it's incumbent on us to really take into account those three assumptions. Uh, and I think I just want to sort of set out a few different ways that we can do that. Um, one of which is to just think about, rather than to constantly thinking about sort of drastic change, thinking about the significance of opening up political space and what is it that we can do to open up that space. I mean, clearly, the recent events uh, and the death of Solo Sandeng and the sentences uh, of, uh, of yesterday and the day before are a clear sign of a, of a very significant closing of political space, and we're right to, to fight against those. Uh, in relation to this election, when we talk about monitoring the election, is the approach in monitoring the election um, by refusing to monitor it because we consider it to be not credible, is that more or less likely to open up political space in the long term? is a, a monitoring mission that uh, is able to track very, very small amounts of progress and condemn massive amounts of backsliding. Is that in itself something that might open up small amounts of political space rather than a refusal to engage in the election <laughs> at all? <laughs> and, and again, I'm, that, I'm posing that as a rhetorical question, not as a, an answer that Human Rights Watch is giving. And so I really think that it's incumbent on all of us to take into account those three assumptions and to think a little bit more constructively for us as we engage with this issue and to avoid the kind of black and white distinction between, uh, you know, it's either going to be a very, very positive change or it's going to continue with uh, the depressing outlook that we have now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jim. So not all is lost. Mm -hmm. Um, let me uh, open it up for Q&A. I know that uh, still we'll have to leave in a few minutes. I would like uh, uh, to give you an opportunity to ask him, um, any questions. Uh, oh, three hands up already. Alexis, long time. Let's start with you. So uh, before, before you ask your questions, please um, uh, state your name, your organization, and a brief question. For those of you who know me, you know that I will cut you off. So. Thanks, Kamisa, for convening this panel, and thanks to the panelists. Um, Alexis Arieff from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, Steve, before you have to take off, I wonder if you could comment on the impact of the failed coup attempt in Gambia on U.S.-Gambian relations and on U.S. leverage with the Jame regime, such as it is. Um, and also, if you could maybe respond to some of the diaspora criticism that the U.S. should not have prosecuted uh, individuals who attempted to carry out this coup from the United States. Great. Uh, thank you. It's good to see you again. Um, so it's, it's a good good question. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, the circumstances behind the, uh, uh, the, the failed coup attempt, I think we're largely behind those, to be honest, at this point. 
And I think partially uh, it's because, you know, we have been very transparent and very clear in terms of, uh, of a legal process uh, when it comes to uh, 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 consequences for uh, U.S. citizens who uh, engage in the type of acts uh, that took place, uh, in particular in violation of the Neutrality Act. Um, you know, I really defer to my colleagues uh, in the U.S. government, uh, in the law enforcement side, the Department of Justice, FBI, uh, to comment further uh, in terms of uh, uh, that process. But, you know, needless to say, uh, one of the key precepts that, that uh, is critical to uh, our perspective, and I think one that gives legitimacy to, to our approach, uh, is, is, is you know, very profound respect for the rule of law and for the laws that are, are, are on the books. And, you know, that's very separate and distinct from our policy decision-making and our policy choices. And, you know, the decisions that are made via uh, the DOJ and the FBI uh, are, there's a clear-cut separation uh, between, you know, the, the State Department uh, policy side of things. Uh, so to, to that extent, you know, I, I don't have a lot more information than the rest of you would have or that you would get from my colleagues over there. Uh, but I would reiterate that, you know, in terms of the, the criticism, you know, we have a very clear process in a rule of law uh, uh, that that needs to to be followed in a situation like that. Thank you, uh, the gentleman right in front of Alexis. My name is Dr. Jacques Dinavo, and I'm with uh, Cohen and Woods International here in Washington. And my question to any one of you is: Is the Gambian government still supporting rebels? In the region. Very good question. The answer to that is absolutely, I'm speaking slowly so that, you know, absolutely 100% yes. And to go further, we all remember that about five years ago, in 2011, there was a shipment of weapons that was intercepted in Nigeria from Iran, destined for the Gambia. And uh, this was the reason why Senegal at the time severed ties with Iran, because they believed 100% that those weapons were meant for the Kasamas rebels. And it was also very telling when the ambassador of Iran in Nigeria stated clearly that that was not the first shipment, that actually that was the third shipment. So that was just the one that they intercepted. And Jame continues to meddle in the affairs of Kasamas, which has become uh, the more reason why the international community must pay attention. And the reason for that is, prior to 1994, the Gambia was known as a country, despite its size, small, very small. Like I said, champion of human rights in Africa, this is why we were privileged to house the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. But even with that, when the Liberia crisis happened, we were in the forefront of trying to solve that problem. When the Iran-Iraq war, I'm not talking about any small country in Africa, Iran-Iraq war, the Gambian president then, who I was an opponent of, was shuttling between these two countries trying to bring peace. But what has happened since then is that we have a regime that has now become an enabler of instability in Africa, starting with whether it is in Kasamas, whether it is in Guinea-Bissau, whether it is anywhere else. He deals with rebels. And this is why, for 22 years, the ceremonial position of chairman of ECOWAS has evaded us. This is something that Gambi used to have to the extent we, don't, we didn't want it anymore. But nobody wants to even elect him as chairman of ECOWAS because everybody in the region does, not, region does not take him seriously. They know that he is trouble, and all he does is meddle in the international affairs in the bad way. And what is happening in Kasamas is an extension, it's just one of many things that he's doing around the world. And this is why, you know, during the leading to the Iraq invasion, by the U.S., Dick Cheney, who I never agreed with, said something that uh, Saddam Hussein was a gathering danger. Yahya Jami is a gathered danger because he is more dangerous than people take him to be. And this is why I believe, like the United States, uh, you know, because they are here, uh, have to take, I think, a more active role in 
solving that problem. Because the United States knows very well what is happening, Jamais' involvement in Casamas. And this is why I was very happy when I read uh, that uh, Obama has imposed sanctions on North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and I think that's his name, and, and he's in a circle. And I'm thinking, OK, for human rights violence, I'm like, well, guess what? You have Yaya Jami in the Gambia, too. He is the, Gambia has now become the North Korea of West Africa. And the United States has more leverage on the Gambia than they do on North Korea. Because guess what? Even though, like you mentioned, Gambians live under less than $2 a day, Yaya Jame has in less than, I think, three miles from here. How many miles? You can walk it, maybe. Yeah, it will take a few days, but you'll get there. A four, almost a $4 million mansion owned by Yaya Jame in the United States of America, the country that values democracy and human rights, a country that is supposed to be encouraging human rights around the world. But just quickly, sorry, about just to add to what you were saying about the situation, the, the, the effects of the coup. You see, uh, Kennedy said something that was very important, that those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. The Gambians have been left with no other choice to change their manner of government legally. Every, the legal opposition are today in jail, sentenced to serve three years for exercising a democratic right, one that is guaranteed by the uh, Gambian Constitution, the African Charter on Human Rights, which is also called the Gambian Charter, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this is why I think the United States and other donor agencies should use their leverage before it is too late to ensure that either Jammeh acts as a democratic leader or help strengthen the legal opposition so that they will be able to give the Gambian people the chance to determine their manner of government. Thank you, Pasamba. Okay, Ni, uh, Tuku, and then Imam Babali. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ni Akwete. I work with the African Immigrant uh, Caucus. My, my question um, uh, tracks closely with what uh, my brother just said, but I'm directing it to the Assistant Secretary. Um, <laughs> um, I think, um, I believe the U.S. can do more, put more pressure on uh, Gambia. It's just within its power. But I also think there are reasons that it should, because, you know, Mr. Jame took over after being trained from the US. When he arrived back in the Gambia a month later, he made a coup. So I think, you know, there is some of us see some responsibility there. There are also rumors that he rented uh, uh, people for torture during the previous administration. So this is somebody who has some, I think, responsibility. U.S. should take some responsibility and put more pressure on him. As he mentioned, there are tough things you do with North Korea. So why not with Gambia? And, and uh, can you explain why the U.S. is not doing more? Because he definitely should be able to do more. Thank you, Ni. Thank you. I, I will have to, unfortunately, leave after uh, 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 answering uh, your question. Uh, and again, you know, I think uh, this, is a, a, this is a difficult conversation. Uh, and, you know, I think people are putting on the table uh, and really articulating a frustration uh, uh, with the situation that doesn't appear to be improving, uh, where there are grave concerns about the trajectory of where things are going, especially even in this year as we get towards elections. Uh, you know, one thing I would say, uh, barring along what Dr. Touré mentioned, uh, what my other colleagues uh, also have, have alluded to, uh, is, is that, you know, I, th I think there is a, a longer game to consider when it comes to how do you bring about the change that you're looking for. Um, you know, I, I know that there can oftentimes be a reflexive move to look towards a non-peaceful means uh, in order to bring about change. Uh, and I would, you know, uh, uh, point to exactly what you said, which is that 
how did uh, President Jammeh get into power in the first place? Through violent means, through coup. So well, the only way to break that kind of cycle is to, to push for change that is peaceful, uh, that builds upon the broader population, and that's inclusive, especially uh, bringing uh, uh, not just the men of, uh, of, of the Gambia, but includes the whole population, uh, women leaders uh, as well. Uh, and I think that's how you ultimately get there. Um, it is something that uh, probably deserves greater attention, uh, not just in the United States at all, uh, but I would say uh, more broadly in the international community, uh, uh, in partner countries uh, around the world, in the region, and otherwise, to think about other creative ways to, to help to incentivize the kind of peaceful change that you're mentioning. Uh, and I would say this, that I think that at least uh, in the last few months, we are starting to see a rising uh, amount of uh, consensus uh, and a heightened amount of rhetoric in many different places, from Geneva to the European Parliament to New York and the UN uh, to uh, other, uh, even in, in, in um, the Gambia itself, from the Af African Human Rights Commission, where people are speaking out and saying, uh, this, is, this is a problem. Uh, these type of violations, uh, no investigations, no accountability, especially in election year, this is a problem. So I, I, uh, I think what's important for the United States uh, is to continue working with partners, uh, with civil society leaders and others uh, to, to uh, continue uh, speaking out about these violations uh, and to look for uh, uh, solutions that will help the situation uh, in the long run. Thank you again. Thank you I very appreciate much for, this. For I apologize for having to leave. No but problem. We do appreciate that. I, uh, I want to hear how the rest of the conversation goes. <laughs> Tuku, you're next. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear? Um, my name is Tuku Jalo, Senegambia Democracy and Governance, Sengo. Um, my first question goes to Dr. Issa Tutre. Dr. Tutre, welcome. And I'm happy to meet with you after talking to you a couple of times. Today is the day that we've met. My question goes to you about the statement you made that when women lead, it makes a difference. And I think I have the feeling that what you said was right. I am asking you if there's any possibilities and chances of you being the leader of a woman wing or leader in, this, in the Gambia as an independent candidate to lead a new um, Gambia for the Gambians to see that we have changes. And also, do you think if that happens, can you make any changes by bringing all the political parties together to unify it as one group and follow you up to, as a credible candidate that you can lead the next coming election? Thank you. What a tough question. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to, I would not want to be you right now. But. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a very good question, but a question that I want to rephrase a little bit, not directly at me, but if the woman leads. And that means it can apply to any credible woman, any woman who has the capacity, the ability, and wants to lead the country, should consider. So I really appreciate your appreciation of me. I am doing what I can within the democracy that exists in the Gambia to promote uh, development and to do a lot of work in order to contribute to the development of the country. But I believe this question can be sent to all Gambian women who have the capacity. But I agree with you, women have the capacity, women can do it, and I am sure women will come out within the parties or as an independent candidate, depending on what it is. We are at a crossroad, and I want to say that not in, uh, uh, it is not a lost game. Commenting and listening to what others have said, election is one of the elements of democracy, free and fair. And if we want to make a non-violent change, a change that is going to be sustainable, a change that is going to help everybody come together, we must put election as a central issue within this current dispensation. And I just want to say objectively that we have the constitution that has given us that opportunity for a free and fair election to take place. We have the environment that we have to 
examine like the, what are the conditions in the environment. President Yame has the right to vote, uh, to look for the votes of the population. Any other Gambian, be you a man or a woman, have rights to come in and say, this is what I can offer Gambians. And we must not fear. We must not be afraid. And this, uh, we, are, we are definitely moving towards that. I want to make that very clear. Now the issue is, let us look at the environment. What are the issues? And some of my colleagues here have actually mentioned some of them, the pre-existing pre environment, the preconditions, and what are the factors that need to be taken account of that will help all of us, helping the current status quo to understand that in a democracy, what we need is to put all the standards together. It will benefit everybody. When you follow the principles and apply the standards, it will benefit everybody, including the status quo, so that what we are now talking about the Gambia, for me, what I am advocating is that we will definitely go to elections. And I have seen it. I live in the Gambia. I have seen the process going on. But it's difficult. Now, what are those difficulties that we can bring together to talk as a group, as Gambians, whether we are within parties or outside parties, whether we are civil society organizations, or what? Individuals in our own right, academics. This is the country, and the country belongs to all of us. The country belongs, does not belong to Yaya Jame alone. It belongs to the Gambians, and that's why Gambians have the right to go to the votes to elect the leader they want. And in a democracy, that is very, that, that is very critical. So for me, I am not mooting the idea of having what we call, uh, it will not be fair. We have to make it fair. We have to make it happen. We also have to ensure that all the procedures are followed. The wall is there to watch. Our consents will also speak to us. As I am talking here today, I'm going back to the Gambia. And I'm going with all this feeling that the Gambia is poised and ready for that. And that the current status quo will listen. It will listen. But let the people engage and not to have that fatalist approach that it is not going to happen. It can't happen. The power of the people is there. And all the parties, all the individuals in the Gambia require the power of the people, the votes. And it is through the electoral process that we have to look at what the issue is. What is the lacuna within this process that we have to address to let it work? And how are we going to strategize to ensure that we want the Gambia we want? We Gambia we want. It is about strategic thinking, strategic planning, constructive engagement, and the fact that the whole world is watching gives puts us in a very good stead. So not all is lost. Not all is lost. The, the president has its own followers. People have right to dissent. People have right to engage in other countries. And people are there who are not within the party and are expressing those these things. But the problem is, how are we conducting the whole process that is affecting others and not others? These are the issues that need to be addressed. But I beg all Gambians that election must not be underscored. It, must, it, 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 is, it is very important that we go through the elections, let people express their views, irrespective of the difficult environment in which we are. And I know that it is possible because Everything is going on course in terms of the IEC. There is a lot of discussions. Yes, there are unfortunate issues, and I want to underscore that. The current political uh, parties are facing a lot of difficulties, and it is not only because of today that I'm saying it. We have heard it from the people who are within those parties. We have observed them. We have seen them in documents. But we have to, it's competition. It is competition. How are we going to wade within those and see how to bring the quality together for them to decide? It's very important. I know it's hard, but we can make it. It has happened in other countries, and they have succeeded. Democracy is not given. You have to demand for it. You have to exercise it. You have to call for it, and you have to follow the principles. It is possible. So any woman, women have rights, and I think I would encourage Gambian women and men to come out. Let us look for a credible rising, depending on what you call credibility, to make sure that the Gambia, to make sure that the Gambia joins the community of nations to get all of you who are here today to feel free to come back to the Gambia, to contribute to your quota, to support the process, and make things happen for the betterment of the Gambia, and to gain our respect in the community of nations all over the world. That's what we need. And thank you very much for having that uh, trust in me. We hope that somebody will emerge, whether me or somebody else, but definitely people are going to come to exercise their franchise. Thank you.
just add to that. She gave me goosebumps. Okay, Jim. Yeah, Dr. Tori obviously is a very tough act to follow, so I'll do my best. Um, but no, I just wanted to sort of pick up on a couple of points that she made and, and also the issue of sanctions. Um, and I think that the, the word sort of strategic plan um, that Dr. Tori mentioned, I think is very relevant and, and gets to the point about the need for both a longer term vision and a shorter term vision. Um, and in the short term, I, I think it's very, very right that we're all focused on the, the abuses since April 14th, um, including uh, the convictions of yesterday and the day before. And I think that as the US government considers the range of options that it has, uh, sanctions, uh, and it certainly should ask itself whether the imposition of, of travel bans and asset freezes have the capacity to create a greater civic space and to address uh, the abuses uh, such as the convictions of yesterday. I think that's certainly a, US, a question the US government should be asking itself very, very carefully. Um, and at the same time, I also think it's important that in the longer term, we acknowledge what Dr. Torre hinted at, which is that Inside the Gambia right now, there is a inter-party dialogue mm -hmm. that is supposedly happening between the ruling party and opposition parties. It, it's meeting, I think, this week. It, it met um, last week. The goal of that inter-party dialogue is supposedly electoral reform. Now, there are many reasons why that dialogue may not be genuine. I think probably many people in this room would say that a lot of that is perhaps due to bad faith of the government. But also, if we're being constructive, we can say, well, is there a, a, an opposition platform that has got a unified request for a set of electoral reforms? And if so, what are those electoral reforms? And, and that's something that at this point isn't necessarily present, and it, it has been in the past, and would certainly be something that would make the conversation more specific about what exactly is it that the opposition is calling for, um, for this election to be more credible. That would also then, I think, feed back into the whole issue of what is it the international community should be doing, um, because then as you talk about sanctions, there would be a very specific set of, of benchmarks that Gambian people and the Gambian opposition would be asking for to be met that might allow the US government uh, to be more specific and, and to know exactly what it is that's being asked for as it considers the imposition of sanctions. So again, I'm just sort of emphasizing the need to try and think as broadly and strategically as possible and to avoid too singular an approach to this issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Imam Babali? Good morning to everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I must apologize for my ignorance on so many issues. And uh, my name is, my name is Imam Babali a founder member of Gamco Trap, where I, I said Ture is the executive director. And uh, as of now, I'm the head of Imam Babali Foundation for Peace and Human Rights registered in America here. We are working to advocate more human rights and peace everywhere in the world. Uh, I said just excuse my ignorance on certain issues. I wish Stephen will be here because my, most of my issues will have been addressed with him. In any case, my ignorance is based on the way the international community, including America as a government, under the watch of President Obama. Because we have been doing more than expected efforts to highlight Gambian issues, and the international community is well aware of it, including the American government. Because if you ask, you know, yeah, Jam is very easy to be accused because whatever you accuse, he proves himself right. Always. We are talking about the corruption in the Gambia. Yeah, Jamie's house is, uh, mansion is here in Putuman. It's not a secret to anybody. Yeah, Jamie's frequent visit of his family, his own daughter, is just in New York here going to school. There's no question in that. And there was a time when President Obama visited Africa. We made an effort under the leadership of human rights defenders based in Uganda. We met, including very Steve here, Steve here at the State Department, that Yahya Jammeh should not be invited because when President Obama went to Africa, they don't invite Yahya Jammeh because he, they said his hands are filthy of blood. But at the same time, with the same month, within two, three weeks, Yahya Jammeh was received on the red carpet taking hand with Obama, and those pictures were used in the interest of Yahya Jammeh to campaign and to show his relationship with America. 
So here, we as Gambians, we, are, we as human rights activists, and strongly believe in human rights, we are undermined in many aspects. Because as Dr. Sambajau said, right, if you stop a government to be changed in a peaceful manner, you are encouraging the other way around. And when our heroes went to Gambia on their own, we, of course we don't know about it, we encouraged violence. But when they came, they are now serving sentences. And yet, and government knows it. And here, whilst I'm speaking, an American citizen, a lady, with a responsible lady with her children here in Washington, here in the face of what of Obama and his government, she's serving three years in jail. So at times, I really reach to a level I start questioning. Should I continue advocating for human rights and justice, or should I just keep quiet? Because those who claim to be the champion of human rights, they only practice those liberations where, where you have a country filtered rich with petrol or diamond or something else. Imam Babali, do you have a question? No, I don't have any question. I'm just, I'm just commenting. Because all what, they, all what they said, it should not be limited only to somebody asking. I have a comment. <laughs> and really, my comment is that America, under the watch of Obama, and the international community, they are guilty as far as Gambian con is concerned. And it should be solved as quickly as possible. Going to election with Yaya Jame as at now with the condition, it's just a joke. It is a real joke. We are soldiers stand campaign using his badges, going to people's house, forcing them to vote. Sorry for... <laughs> right. Thank you so long. For you coming. Does anybody have questions? Can I just add to... Uh, yes. Let me take uh, two, two questions. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll give you I the first comment. I just want to... Uh, the gentleman in the front, and then uh, Jeffrey Smith in the back, and then... Uh, sorry? Jabara, Let, let's have Scott, and then and then we'll start with you. Okay. Okay. My name is uh, Demba Jao. I'm a Gambian journalist based in Dakar, Senegal. Currently, um, my question actually is to Mr. Hassan Jao. Um, in his contribution, I think he alluded to the fact that uh, it's not worthwhile to go to elections in the Gambia because of the current situation until there are electoral reforms. Mm -hmm. You know, my question is, um, what is the alternative then? If we don't go to elections, it's like handing over, you know, the, the elections to the silver platter to Yaya Jame. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm encouraged by Dr. Tura's position that actually people must go to elections, whatever happens. I mean, if you mobilize the people, they can vote him out. There's absolutely no doubt about that because he's very, very unpopular in the Gambia today. I know the um, the... the uh, the level, the field, is definitely not quite level to begin with. But I don't see any other alternative for elections. Thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you very much to my former boss. At, uh, we started Amnesty International in the Gambia, from group to society to where it is today. And I was his assistant. I uh, just want to give you credit here. One of the most fearless Gambian journalists, and of course, had to make a point too. Uh, and before, before just answering that question, I just wanted to recognize, uh, Yanko, if you can just stand up. You've been mentioning the American lady who is now serving three years in jail for exercising a democratic right. That's the husband right there. And that's not the first American in jail. Uh, we have two Americans who have disappeared, uh, Alaji Mahmoud Sisi and Ibu Job, now for over two years without trace. Now, the issue at, about elections here, we are Democrats. And what we will want is for democratic change in that country. And this is why even though the Constitution is treated like nothing in the Gambia, we tend to quote it every time. But we have a country where it is not the law according to the Constitution, but a law, the law according to the dictates of the IAJAM. Now, after the 2011 elections, the opposition came with concerns leading to the 2012 parliamentary elections. Those concerns were never addressed, thus leading to the opposition deciding to boycott the, pres the parliamentary elections. In, in, in fact, what they said then was that they did not boycott, they were forced 
out. And I remember one thing that Halifa Salah said then, that they were put, pushed into a vicious corner of whether to participate and be damned and not to participate and be damned. But it would be disingenuous of them, that's the opposition, to participate in elections that they know are not going to be free and fair and then come out and complain about the process. And I believe that still stands today. Now, the reason why I said that there are three contradictions that must be addressed, one of which being the boycott of the elections in 2012, is that you cannot boycott elections up to, I think, October of 2015. Because the by-elections that they had in Salum, the opposition, except Ahmad, who is the NRP, which has been participating in all elections, the opposition all boycotted it because the condition was not conducive there. And their boycott of 2012 election had nothing to do with the 2015 election ele uh, amendment act. Basanda, that, no? but, um, I would like to, to go through all of the, the, the remaining uh, questions, so I'll give you one minute to finish. Okay. So my thing is, we want elections, but we want to participate in genuine elections. And just going to elections for the sake of, just because it is a process and we must participate, I don't think is enough. And if the opposition wants to go to elections, I would appeal to the international community to help them make it competitive. But if they're going to elections that are fraudulent, especially now when Usainu and everybody is in jail, they must better make it uh, you know, worthwhile for people to believe that their, their, their votes would count. But I think this is a conversation that would continue. So in the interest of time, I hope I've addressed that. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Touré wanted to make a, a, a small comment. Yes, I just wanted to uh, throw back to you to reflect and learn from our mistakes. That uh, I know there is a morbid uh, disenchantment of Gambians at home and within the diaspora. That there is going to be um, uh, 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 not going to be a free and fair election. I think if we are shadowed with that, we will not do critical thinking. We will not be able to address the issue. What is important, every political party strategizes in whatever it does. And how you strategize sometimes can be a public opinion, uh, publicly known, and then you have the internal dimensions. Here, what I am just trying to put together is to let you know that we can, what is the lesson that we are at and what do we want? If we have too much on our heads about the Gambia, we will not succeed. But if we understand and clearly define what the issue is, and say this is the part to it. You talked about the Amendment Act. There is so much flaws about that, that it, it, that act in itself can disenfranchise a lot of people. When you talk about the $2 per day, how many people can get 500,000 or $1 million to participate? How are we going to ensure that because it is there, we want to change it? You have to go through elections to have the powers and the opportunities to be able to deal, the, to deal with the Amendment Act. You also have to get the people who are going to be there to be able to make these policy reforms and law reforms for things to happen. So if we put the cart before the horse, it becomes problematic. We need the right type of profile, the right type of people to be there, to be able to engage, and not to chew too much, but to take a process like Wolf of said, and we have to look at it in different ways. So the strategy is, one, let us be positive. I am in the Gambia. I know that there is a lot of preparation going on. I know that it is difficult. Of course, that difficulty should not be it's a challenge. But how do we learn to get out of that difficulty? The uh, opposition are talking, but are they talking together, frankly speaking? Are they coming in a common platform? How, what, what are the issues that are being done? We who are sitting down watching and looking, what are we seeing? There is nothing that is coming out concretely. I want to honor and recognize and respect the UDP and its leader and those pro-democratic activists who came out to fight in a non-violent way to ensure that there are electoral reforms. But look at what it has given us. Nobody is happy about that, particularly giving, taking women who are breastfeeding to the prison is painful. We all know that. And I am here feeling for all of them. But the issue is, this is just a process. Let us identify ways and means 
of how we get there to ensure that the electoral process is free and fair, democracy is restored. It is not a one-off. It is a plethora of strategies that we have to put in. But we must focus. We must get there first. Thank you Somebody very much. Somebody has to be there. It is possible. We can do it, and it can happen. That's what I want to tell you. Thank you. It is possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jeffrey, I'm sure you really want to ask your question. So Jeffrey, Scott, and then Mr. Jawaha. Thank you. Um, I was going to use this opportunity to put Daz on the spot, but uh, since he's not here, I'll, I'll address my question to Coach. Um, you made a very good point at the beginning where you mentioned that, um, you know, very poignantly that Gambia is now a country of victims. Um, what many people don't know is it's also a country of asylum seekers, refugees, and, and migrants. Uh, through the first half of 2015, for instance, they were actually number five in the world in terms of total numbers of people crossing the Mediterranean to Italy. Uh, this is a population of 1.8 million people. Uh, they were behind Syria, Nigeria, Eritrea, and, and Mali. They're also number two behind Egypt in terms of unaccompanied children passing the Mediterranean. Again, a staggering number. Egypt, which has, I believe, upwards of 100 times the population of Gambia. So um, my question to you, Coach, is, you know, given the, the dire situation that, that you laid out um, th that currently prevails in the Gambia, and given the fact that there really is a threat of state-led mass killing leading up to the election, the, the early warning project estimated Gambia is having the fourth highest statistical increase in the world last year for this threat. Um, and given the work that you've done in the diaspora with your colleagues at Duga and elsewhere, and now the work of international civil society, what have you found to be most helpful? What issues can we help push forward um, to give a further platform? What have you found both to be most helpful and also what, what issues we should potentially stay away from uh, five months now out from elections? And how can we, basically how can we help you and your efforts? Thank you. Uh, well, great, great question, and I'm glad you brought out those statistics. Uh, the issue that really confronts us, that people really need to focus on, is the need for democracy. Because the reason for the migration is because we have a country where people are oppressed and hopeless. Mm -hmm. Because the Gambia today, <laughs> which in the 90s was second in GDP to only two other countries in Africa, that was Cote d'Ivoire and Cape Verde. Today, the Gambia is the only country within ECOWAS whose GDP has been regressing. Everybody has been progress progressing, we've been regressing, and that is because of the bad policies of the regime and the dictatorship that we have in place. And so to us, the diaspora, for the most part, our focus is to have an open democratic space where people's views would be expressed, people's rights would be respected, where businesses are not going to be... All, because if you look at the Gambia today, Yaya Jame sells meat, he sells ram, he sells diapers, he sells... So businesses compete with Jame. He uses the military to run his business. So meaning that even the business space has shrunk so much that people do not have anything to do leading to the hopelessness in that. So what we want the international community and those that we've been working for to help and focus on is to open up that country so that it would be democratic like it was. I just want to point out something, and you can cut me off anytime. I tend to talk a lot. Is that in the 90s, seconds. yes, in the 90s, when the coup happened, Gambia was one of the only democratic countries in Africa. And the 90s were referred to as the democratization process in Africa because everybody was rioting for, for, for elections in Africa. So what happened was we were taking back to where people were running from. Now we've taken from one extreme to the next. Now we've become the most territorial government uh, in, in the region. And unless and until that is addressed, where people, the democratic space is open, people have the rights to respect their fundamental human and constitutional rights. You will continue to have this problem, and it would affect everybody, because even the migration, Brexit did not happen just like that. It, the xenophobia that you have in Europe is as a result of people migrating. And the people that are migrating, for the most part, are migrating because of the dictatorships that are happening in those countries. Gambians do not used to mi migrate like that. We were not known as asylum seekers. Today, we are the most, we, we, in fact, we form the greatest part of asylum seekers. If we are in the same, breath with Syria and all these countries that are ravaged by wars, we have a problem. And one thing finally that people must also be mindful of is that let's not look at the situation in the Gambia and say, you know what, uh, there is peace in that country. Dr. King said that 
true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice, which is lacking in that country. And unless there is justice and democracy, Gambia cannot be considered as a peaceful nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Basamba. Uh, Scott. Good morning. I'm Scott Morgan, President of Red Eagle Enterprises. I do security and threat analysis in Africa and other parts of the world. When it comes to openness and democracy in Gambia, the best way to open it up is to start holding Yahya accountable for his complicity in both the narcotics and human trafficking trades going from, and when it comes to drugs, from going from South America to Europe and from human trafficking going from Central Africa, using the migrants going into Western Europe. Until you start holding him accountable and exposing, the, and exposing him to this, and this is where very few people in the civil society in the Gambia and the opposition, very few of them have been willing to talk about it. That's something you should start to talk about now, seeing he's complicit in all this. Why aren't you doing it? And, when, and if, you're, if you're planning on doing it, when do you start to do it? Because you should be doing it right now. Um, Mr. Jawaha. Yes, uh, my name is Ibrahim Jawara, Frontal Jawara Husband. Uh, I want to thank Jeff and uh, all of you guys in the panel and uh, Erin at, at the Governor Bill's office. Uh, my question is just at the panel is uh, how can all of us can help again to bring my wife, apart from what the Congress, uh, State Department are doing right now, how can they help to bring my wife back here? Anybody wanna? Thank you, Mr. Jawara, and we really feel your pain. Uh, I believe uh, the United States government, in particular, has a moral responsibility to ensure that her citizens are protected and should not be languishing in jails, irrespective of whether they are naturalized citizens or not. Because what has happened to your wife? to Ibu Job, to Alaji Mahmoud Sisi, should be shameful to the Obama administration. And this brings us back to what Imam was saying, because it is absolutely insulting to the very ideals of this country that the government that kidnapped two of your citizens is invited and giving a red carpet reception at the White House. So unless the United States wants to, wants to stand up to Yaya Jami, we'll continue to have this problem. And this brings this issue that Ni uh, uh, alluded to earlier, this complicity, if you want to call it that. Because when Yaya had his coup, the, the USS Lamo County was in the Gambia, a US Navy ship. This was a few months after the United States intervened in, in, in Haiti to restore a democratically elected government when everybody in the world was put on notice that America was not going to stand by and let anybody overthrow a democratically elected government. So the United States must be very clear with us, the Gambian people, and tell us what their position is as regards to Yaya Jame and the dictatorship that is happening there. I believe they are encouraging it in a way. Because if Yaya Jame finds it so comfortable to buy a $4 million mansion here in the United States, half his daughter going to school here, paying $82,000 a year to go to school in the United States. The wife gets here, goes to Sam's Club, shops, and does everything that they want in the United States. And there is somebody who has kidnapped your citizens? So what we can do is to continue advocacy and to also put the United States to task because it is their responsibility to free their citizen. Fanta Jawara is as important to America as Obama is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim, and then we'll go uh, to the last question. I wanted to respond. Thank you very much for your question. I'm obviously extremely sorry for what's happening to your family. Mm -hmm. I think that the stories that have come out about your daughters and their struggle to have your wife home have been one of the sort of most powerful ways of bringing attention to what's happening in the Gambia. So thank you very much for your courage and, and that of your family. Um, you know, I, I don't, Das Feldstein is not here. And, um, you know, I think that as we talk about these issues, and I think migration is another one, um, I do think it sort of underscores again the need for us all to think very, very strategically, and I'm not really directing that response to you, but just to kind of us as a community. Um, and 
just to take the migration example, um, I've spoken to, to high-level European Union officials about that issue. Um, and, you know, they see migration as having two dimensions. They see migration as, as yes, having a dimension of, of oppression. Um, and they also see migration as having a dimension of economic opportunity. And so as they think about the policies that they make, and, and they're the ones that ultimately make the decision, they think, well, on the one hand, how do I increase opportunity, economic opportunity for Gambians? And on the other hand, how do I address oppression? And those two things are not always mutually compatible at this current point because it is a regime that is so entrenched. And so they have to think about development and they have to think about how do we raise the, the rest of Gambians out of poverty while knowing that the regime is entrenched. And that means that sometimes they're not as strong as we in the human rights community think that they should be as regards the oppression. So it's all very well for us all to talk about oppression here, but we also have to take into account as we make those arguments that dimension. Um, and so we do, again, in making the argument about sanctions and, and people talking about sanctions, we have to talk about how that fits within a longer term vision um, for, for changing Gambia. In relation to your wife, I know that there's some fantastic work that's going on to, to free her um, beside, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, again, um, the best recipe for freeing her may well be that combination of the stick and, and the discussion around sanctions and the behind-the-scenes work that's been happening. And so you know, I really encourage you to, to think about that um, as you, I mean, I'm, the people that you're working with, you're already doing a fantastic job. But I think it's a lesson for how we can make change. It has to be both the behind-the-scenes constructive work and the, the stick that we hold as well. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, there is a gentleman who's been very patient. Yes? Hi, my name is Jeremy Cadden. I'm with the Human Rights Campaign. And uh, while this event has focused broadly on human rights, which I think is very appropriate, um, I did want to focus in on one particular group, which is sexual minorities within the Gambia and uh, the, the LGBT population, which uh, President Jama has for some reason decided that he is going to target and, uh, and, and call out um, at, at deserving of death. And um, so I, I just wanted to, to get your sense. Is this going in and out? Um, okay. I just wanted to get your sense as to why President Jama has decided to target uh, that group and uh, if there are things in particular that, that we haven't mentioned so far in this, uh, in this event that, that could help uh, to, uh, to help uh, protect LGBT people in the Gambia and uh, try to stop some of the, uh, the especially the rhetoric that, that President Jama has been uh, targeting them with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can take one last question. Yeah, yeah, Darbo. Yes, uh, uh, my name is Yaya Dabo. I'm from Gambia. Um, we all know that um, there is very little activity in the civil society groups in the political space in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for a long, long time. And uh, so the question to Dr. Toure is, in lieu of that fact, what are the challenges to civil society groups that want to operate in the political space in the Gambia? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, may I just first and foremost respond to one of our brothers, Mr. Jawara, to say that we are together with you. A lot of things, like my colleague said, Jim, a lot of things are happening. And mm, different women's rights organizations and other legal entities have been doing a lot, not only about Fatma, about your, your Mrs. Jawara, but also all other women's rights activists and political uh, 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 pro-democracy political um, activists who are behind the bus, like Usainu Dabo and his 28 executive with the 11 women, including your wife, and many others who have had the same type of crime that is big, purportedly alleged against them. So I think it's a question of human rights and also looking at the universality of rights and the indivisibility of rights that we raise the agency of all those people who are trying to promote those standards. Uh, whilst the US is going to promote that of Fatumata, I want the US also to please include all the other Gambians who have worked together with Fatumata to push democracy and make it happen uh, as a concern because it's the same crime that they have been uh, accused of and there's a lot of work going on so that the Gambia moves on. To, uh, but please uh, be patient. I, I have been a victim, and many others have been victims before me. 
if you are in a struggle, these are things that you must expect. And I understand how you feel when you spoke. The other question I want to say is true. You know, we are having the tango, and the critical issue that you have, this is a very critical question. Um, NGOs are considered apolitical, but they are development partners supporting the state, and each of them have their own mandates. And within those mandates, they try as much as possible to get into the whole discourse. But the umbrella body in itself is weak. This is my personal view. And the fact that it is weak, it is difficult to galvanize around that. So in our own case, because we are a women's rights organization, what we did was to raise the issues that were affecting those women, including applying human rights standards to all. That was our approach. And as it is now, I think we are now talking about the issues and not the root causes of the problem. And until we are able to problematize, we are problematizing the issues. But we have to strategically, I want you to listen to me very carefully, we have to strategically address these issues. And that can only happen if we are able to come together and effect the type of change that all of us are calling for. And that includes the existing party, the status quo that is ruling, including those that are yet to come. We have to sit down and think about how do we want to ha ha make it happen. And as I said, you don't have to chew too much. You only have to focus on what you want. If you have unity of purpose and direction and follow. I want to give you the example of my fight, my organization's fight to end FGM in the Gambia. I was incarcerated with my colleague Ami Bojang Sisoho because we were talking to the communities about FGM, early marriage and women's rights, sexual reproductive health rights. Everybody, there was a big, 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 big challenge against us to the point that the religious scholars, the state itself was not very positive towards us at the beginning because they thought it was a religious injunction. But then you have all had after 20 or 30 years of advocacy and when people were becoming aware, we were focusing, we were taken to prison. And I said in the prison, I'm going to continue. We sensitized the prisoners. We talked to those women, you understand? And we came out, we were on bail, we continued. Because I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to end FGM and early marriage. That's what our organization's purpose was. And we knew there were so many stumbling blocks. But the important thing was, the people, it was the people that matter. Those who were going to make the informed choices to protect their children from FGM, those who would come out to make the public declarations and make public statements to say that they have abandoned it. It got to a point where the status quo had to come and join, it, uh, join us. We've won the battle because after 21 years, of researching, he said. He came to say that it is not a religious injunction, and he made a very blunt statement uh, uh, talking about it, and now it has come to an end. Whether people are stopping, but we know that we have achieved the goal of doing that, and now the issue is the whole of Gambia is coming together to celebrate that, and everybody is part of it. So you must have unity of purpose and direction and focus in what we want. All these issues that you are talking are very legitimate. It's very legitimate, everybody is talking. But then how are we going to move further? When you do work, you, don't, you cannot address everything. You have to get the critical issue about how to do it and then follow it to make it happen. I really recognize everything that is being said about the Gambia. I am living in the Gambia, I am going back. I came to share my work, to listen, to hear. I am going back and I'm going to talk, I'm going to also write on the papers. You understand? And these are all things that we have to do. We are in a crossroad, but it is possible, it will happen, and I can assure you today that let us all be positive and work towards that positive vibe. It will happen, despite the blocks, despite the difficulties. Even if you go out to farm, you find these big trees, you try to fell them. You remove the stumps, you burn them. You create a space where you want to bring in your own species of crop, isn't it? So let us think in that direction and see how it works. Yes. The U.S. and other international partners are very critical and important into what we do. And we really appreciate the effort that is being done, particularly with the Gambian diaspora and all the other actors. But at the end of the day, this has to happen in the Gambia. It has to happen in the Gambia. And if it is going to happen in the Gambia, we have to understand the environment very well. We have to understand, because nobody is telling us not to go out and vote. Nobody is telling us not to engage in the political process. Nobody, but there are difficulties, we are all aware of that. 
And those difficulties, we have to sit down and think strategically, how do we address it? I am going out to talk to the women and men of the Gambia to tell them, you must vote women. These are their rights. They must know it and so on. I'm not doing partisan politics. I'm dealing with development politics and de addressing gender inequality. I have not been stopped, but I have faced challenges. Because sometimes the NIA will come and tell me, yes, I am from the office of the NIA. I have come to listen to you. I said, sit down. <laughs> you sit down and listen to what I'm saying. Then you go and report what it is. So you are actually empowering. You don't see uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. But how are you going to make, convert that challenge into a way that is going to benefit even the person who feels that you are against them? That's the whole thing. Thank we you. have to be very positive. It is possible and it can happen. And I want all of you to put an eye on the Gambia. All these things that are being said is true. But to be frank and to be honest to you, the space is there for us to make use of. Thank you very much. Uh, did somebody have an answer uh, regarding the LGBT uh, question? Thank you, Jeremy, for that question about the LBGT issue. And this is, that issue puts the Gambia in perspective. In that Yaya Jame does things, he's a big pandara. Yaya Jame doesn't do anything that is in the interest of the Gambian people. He does things that is in his interest at, at the moment. And the LBGT issue can easily be tied to the illegal declaration of the Gambia as an Islamic state. Because you're gonna declare a Gambian Islamic state and then condone LBGT issues. So he is doing it to not promote what is in the interest of the Gambian people, but to promote his own agenda. Gambia has never had an LBGT problem. Mm -hmm. It is not very open, mm -hmm. but anybody who lives in the Gambia knows that that has been there forever. Mm -hmm. So it has become <coughs> Jammeh's problem, and he used it for propaganda. And this is where the international community must not be fooled by what Jame does. Because when Jame declares, you know what, I'm ending uh, uh, FJM. The issue here is, let's not look at the good intention in ending FJM, but whether it is legal for Jame to make a declaration and end it on his own. You talked about the child marriage issue. He's using it again as a pawn. But if you go to the Gambian constitution, section 27, of the Constitution, subsection 1, says that Gambi, men and women of full age can marry each other. What is full age? It's not a child. And if you go to section 27, subsection 2, it also states clearly that to enter into marriage, both parties must have the consent. You cannot enter into a marriage without the consent of one. So meaning even forced marriages is prohibited according to our constitution. But what tends to happen, Jami will make this declaration, and the international community, some, some human rights organization will, will applaud him all for, for banning uh, child marriage. But what in essence he is doing is violating the constitution because he does not have the unilateral powers to make a declaration and make it a law. So why we must encourage the end to this you know, practices? We cannot also allow it to be done through an abrogation of the Constitution. So the LBGT issue is not a Gambian problem. It is a Yaya Jame problem. Gambians do not have a problem with people that are gay or lesbians. We've lived with them forever. Thank you very much. And that's the issue. Thank you, Sam. Okay. May I just uh, give an addendum to what he's saying or to make certain clarifications? And, and just and conclude. Yes. In, uh, in regards to the declaration that the president made and with regards to the issue of early and marriage and FGM, I think uh, if you look into the conventions, there is a section that state parties have to come out clearly about supporting the ending of FGM. And I just want to say that his making, that proclamation he made was very positive. Positive for the rights activists and the advocacy work surrounding early marriage. In the constitution, there is no specific age of marriage and this could be abused. Because of that vagueness, that is why women's rights organizations were coming out to advance for the 18 year and above uh, the, age, the age limit. Then you come to the issue of uh, uh, the uh, FGM. There was no law against FGM, but there was this Children's Act in which it was mentioned. 
Now, having mentioned it, it was very vague and it was not clearly specified. So for him to come out and make that is strengthening our advocacy work, even though I would not give him the credit because the credit goes to the people who were listening, who were engaged, Gamco Trap and other women's rights organizations and institutions, the UN and all those par uh, partners were involved in supporting advocacy work to create awareness of the effects of FGM and early marriage on the welfare of the welfare of the women and children. And the communities were abandoning them even before. We had five declarations on the Gamco Trap project where 158 circumcisers had uh, declared to end FGM. 1,015 communities out of 1,877 communities in the Gambia had already made a public, uh, public declaration so that he cannot sit down and wait the carpet drawn under his feet. And therefore, he must join the forces. That is why the power of the people is important. The power of the people is important. Sensitize the people, create awareness, give them the opportunities, and therefore, they will get what, you want, what they want. That is why. But I think his statement and the efforts he made in putting his uh, this thing, and it is also a, an AU condition that leaders must engage their wives, the wives of uh, uh, the presidents and the president themselves and the institutions to support the work to protect the rights of the girl child. And I want to give to say thank you to him for that. But then I also want to give credit to the polity who have listened and took the responsibility to end FGM and early marriage in the Gambia. That pronouncement was not law. We have to understand the procedural issues. He can, that's a political will. And that political will is important when you do advocacy work around women's rights issues to ensure that the enabling environment is there. Now, it is that pronouncement that has forced, in the context of the Gambia, the National Assembly members to go to parliament and make a law, a, law, a law against FGM. If it were not for that, we have been advocating for a long time and engaging the National Assembly members. They were not ready to take a decision because they felt that they will lose their votes. Thank so you. how politicized it is. Thank you so I want much. to thank him for that. Thank you very much, Dr. Toure. On this note, I would like to thank all of you for being here. I would like to thank the panelists for making this discussion such a rich discussion. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank my colleagues uh, for making this event a success, Elizabeth for uh, putting this event together, and I also would like to thank Yaya Darbo, who is the first Gambian whom I've met here in the U.S. He came to, to me uh, after I was hired at the net and said, you have to look at the Gambia, and that's how we started our program there. So thank you for, uh, for being here again, and uh, let's continue the discussion. Thank you.